Okay, I'm gonna give him a call. physically bring them in Pittsburgh to use the technology that we have in school, we're a tech school, to bring them to school. Um, before we start, we want to acknowledge, us at Saba want to acknowledge the horrendous terrorist attack that happened yesterday in Pulwama in Jammu Kashmir. Uh, we want to condemn this violence by state sponsored of terrorism and take a stand that, you know, we are always going to be nation builders and we're never going to be nation destroyers. And uh, we have someone who is a nation builder today. We're lucky to have him today. Um, so it was, it was in 2010, actually, when I was playing table tennis in University of Maryland. And this PhD student is playing with me. And then we get talking. And uh, in his classic fashion, he says, Yar, which is another word for bro. He's like, I want to I quit PhD. I want to go back to India. And then I was like, OK, like, what's your plan B? Like, what do you want to do in India? He's like, I don't know figure it out. But uh, you know, he took the leap and lo and behold, he's created uh, Jumnu Auto, which is India's largest technology aggregator for auto rickshaws. Uh, auto rickshaws are tuk-tuks for those not familiar. And uh, they process 50,000 transactions a day across 45 cities in India. And I've recently expanded their platform to 32 different countries as well. And he's also the founder of Click Labs, which is an aggregator he will talk about um, shortly. So, before further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Samar. Okay, yeah. Thanks, guys. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, thanks, Ashay, for inviting me. And uh, he's already told you guys about uh, how we met. So, so we were playing table tennis, and uh, yeah, you know, I was thinking of uh, quitting PhD at that time. Going to India. So let me start there, and I think uh, I'll take a few minutes uh, on the journey part, and uh, then uh, I think uh, we we'll get into questions and answers. That's good. So, uh, so yeah, so I I graduated got uh, I graduated from IIT Delhi in India, and then uh, came to UMD uh, University of Maryland uh, College Park, where I met Ashay, and uh, uh, so so the. That you know, I'll basically go for PhD and uh, essentially you know start something in US. But when I came here, came uh, to US, you know the, the biggest issue I was facing was the whole life was so uh, you know high maintenance per se, right? Uh, that all the time I was always thinking about okay, you know how do I get by? Like that that's where the 90% bandwidth was going, right? And in India. Uh, fortunately, I had never had to think about uh, getting by, right? I mean, everything was so cheap, you know, you practically didn't have to think about it. So this was like a big deal for me. And I started thinking, uh, going back, and uh, as chance would have it, my father was running poultry farms at that point. Very bad business in India. I mean, farming in general, I think it globally is not really a very good business. So he was running uh, poultry farms. And the University of Maryland, uh, incidentally, is pretty good in poultry research, right? And uh, they were doing uh, some good research there, and they had developed uh, an idea called BDGS. So it was a new poultry ingredient that uh, you know some professors at UMD and others have collaborated on, and they had developed it. So I started going into the labs, and uh, I realized that in India, the raw materials were different. So, so, so. You know, when I was in the US, I thought, okay, I'll do something in this area, came back to India, and I realized that, okay, this is not really the same thing. 
in the US they use corn and in India they use rice to distill grains. So, so essentially the raw material was rice in India which was corn in the US. So, so my idea didn't really go far. So then I did some research and found out that in China actually they did use rice and I wrote to some people in, uh, in China and, and you know somebody helped me and then I wrote to a lab in Germany who, who kind of you know just helped me as a student doing research and essentially just got my idea off the ground from a technical perspective. Then I uh, started producing and what happened was that nobody would buy it. Like so poultry is such a market that uh, everybody really just wants to you know not take any risk and uh, for about a year I was producing and nobody would buy it. So we were like almost at end of our runway. So I took a loan and I had a runway of about a year. And so we were almost at end of our runway. And uh, you know, uh, somebody's misfortune becomes somebody else's fortune. So what happened? That year, there was this El Nino effect and uh, Argentina and Brazil had a big drought. So they are uh, the largest producers of soy in, in the world. Soy meal is uh, one of the biggest poultry ingredients. So that happened and instantly, you know, my product, which was a replacement for that, became pretty hot. So because it was much cheaper than soy, soy became expensive overnight almost. So, so after, you know, about a year and a half of, uh, you know, really struggling without any revenues to speak of, and at almost the end of our runway, we became super hot as a company, you know, we made pretty good amount of money, you know, maybe like uh, roughly $200,000 in USD terms in a month, which was pretty good money in India at that point. And, uh, and I realized that, you know, eventually this business will become a commodity business. But, but it was my first break, right? So, so we got lucky, but we got lucky after a year and a half. So the lesson was that, you know, just hang in there and you will get lucky eventually. And uh, yeah, I mean, there were much more ups and downs in the in the process. So I sold that company, and then I started uh, Click Labs, which was uh, again I started out as a as a consulting thing because when I sold this company, I thought, okay, I want to do something in technology. So I was a physics guy from education, and uh, you know, so I thought, why not get into technology? So I didn't know how to build technology really from a product perspective. So I thought, okay, let's consult with people. And uh, eventually, I will hopefully you know, learn how to do products of my own. So I did consulting for a few years, and uh, you know that's when I had the confidence to really start Jugnu. And uh, you know, started Jugnu four years ago. And it's been a pretty, pretty kind of interesting ride because you know most people when we started told us that uh, this is a saturated market. You know, Uber is going to kill us and stuff like that. And uh, what I realized is that, you know, in a uh, seemingly saturated market, sometimes there's no competition because nobody was really doing it. Everybody was so sure of Uber killing the space that uh, nobody really tried. So, so I think that's, uh, that's really, you know, where we are at today. And today we are, as Ashe mentioned, we are in 40 plus, country, uh, 40 plus cities, doing around 50,000 rides and uh, really, you know, uh, I think it's a, it's a, we have about 10 million uh, customers in total. So it's a fairly, has been a fairly uh, adventurous ride. And uh, also Click Labs, I run it uh, still, and uh, it's a SaaS company, it's profitable, we have about 500 people in that. So, so it's uh, between these two companies, I think uh, we've been doing uh, okay, and now we have a platform where we can hopefully build a, build a decent sized company. I think uh, that sounds good. Yeah, great. I mean, so that is actually a fascinating journey, right? Because not many people would actually take a leap to go poultry farming or have no plan B. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, for those, so I think I'm bad at planning, guys. So <laughs> if you want to start up, just don't be good at planning. That, that's a lesson. Don't plan. Uh, so I mean, so obviously, you know, dealing with auto rickshaws and auto drivers is like dealing with the lowest common denominator in India. You deal with farmers, you deal with autos, they're low income, the trust is very low. So uh, somewhat, how did you go about validating the market for these auto rickshaws? Um, how did you get them to convince, how did you convince them to join your platform? And essentially how did you go from zero to one? Because you know, trust is a major yeah. issue. 
Actually, so, so see, it's a, it's a very interesting story. So you know, as I mentioned, I was running Quick Labs, which was this uh, consulting company, right? And uh, and what happened is we we there there is this uh, technology festival uh, college in in our uh, in our city, right? It's a it's a decent college, and uh, during our student time, we actually had a lot of free food there, right? So so those students came to us and asked for sponsorship. So I said, guys, I really owe you something because I've really had a lot of free food from your college in my student time. So, so let's uh, let's kind of you know do some experiment, and you know, uh, so as just as a fun experiment, we actually put together an app. It was just really a front end. There was no back end at all, right? So, so there were ten auto rickshaws standing outside the gate of the college, and anybody who requested. And me and three more more people were standing, like you know, just our employees, like you know, co-founders sort of. And uh, we would just, you know, send a guy to one rickshaw, and and that will be done. So essentially, we thought, okay, it will be like a pseudo Uber meme kind of thing, which will not a rickshaw, which will look like an app, but there won't really be an app in the back end because we were just planning to shut it down after the college uh, fest ended, right? So so that was the game plan. And uh, what happened is, so the first day we did about you know because everybody would get a free ride home, um, and you know they would press that button on the app. But what happened is, which we didn't expect, is that the next day people actually started pressing that button again in the morning, and there were no auto rickshaws because because we had no packet right. I mean, no auto rickshaw driver had the app. So so we said okay, this is happening. So people are pressing the button. And so we put an email together that you know anybody would press a button and email would come and you know we'll actually call the guy and tell him that dude there is no app really so so this is just for the college test and uh, the next day you know we did about hundred rides uh, in the same fashion you know manually doing everything the next day you know like there were approximately two hundred people pressing the button. And we were emailing, and we thought, let's let's just do this. You know, how big a deal is that? You know, people are requesting. Why don't we just try it out? And we actually started trying, and uh, you know, we start we built the app. I mean, luckily, my co-founder Chimay was uh, you know pretty ready. Like we were already doing this stuff inside out, right? I mean, we were very comfortable with technology by that time, so we were just like building it on the go. Right. So, for example, uh, third day we decided, okay, let's build it. So, by the end of the day, we were like receiving requests, and you know, people uh, would uh, still call the driver, and uh, and the driver would go. So, so essentially, in about seven days' time, we were able to not call anybody, but we still had to call because people would, you know, keep the phone ringing. The auto driver would see, okay, the phone is ringing, but he would not really know what to do, sort of thing. So, so that's like you know, so in a week's time or maybe ten days time, they had the MVP running and the market was genuinely there, right? I mean, people were interested in the concept, so so that gave us confidence. And now started the you know process of really like going to drivers and convincing them because definitely that was the difficult, most difficult part. And to this day, we consume we we consider the drivers are uh, our true. Customers, not really passengers, right? I mean, passengers are easy because when you need a ride, you need a ride, right? But uh, drivers are really the tough, uh, tough nuts to crack. And in India, you know, they didn't have uh, bank accounts, so we started to open up their bank accounts. They didn't have uh, smartphones, so we figured out deals with the uh, with the uh, uh, companies to give them smartphones where you know they would pay back for the smartphone in over a year's time. Same thing with data. So essentially, you know. Uh, one issue was obviously the logistical side of things, right? Like how do you get everything in place, and that took some working, but it was doable, right? I mean, still, like everything was there. We were not reinventing the, it's like you know, collaborating with ten people and kind of getting them together to do work in a certain way. And then the second issue was, uh, you know, the the behavior change, the driver behavior change. So you know, I I would say. What we realized was that uh, if you really try and select people very very carefully in the beginning, there's always a certain number of people who believe in new ideas, no matter what the demography is. You know, same with auto drivers, there were some very maybe you know five percent people who actually thought this could work, and uh, and, you know, and this is what I found throughout. 
in my journey is that there are always some believers. You know, they might not really, uh, you know, like give an arm or a leg to the focus on your idea or something, but they'll give it a try if you make it easy enough for them. And that's what we did, right? And we found those early adopters in the driver's side and really focused on them, you know, even if it meant that the supply was not very dense and stuff. So, so our thesis was almost opposite of Uber, right? Uber said, said, okay, let's give them a lot of money and everybody will come. We didn't really have much money. So we said, okay, let's just find those guys who are really, really passionate about this and let's see if consumers can still figure it out, right? So we always said, okay, you know, don't worry much about the consumer because anyway, he's going to try Uber first and, you know, uh, if he doesn't get it, then he's coming to our platform, so it's okay. So we were always very dismissive of the, the consumer in that sense. I mean, I don't mean it in a bad way, but we didn't really have a choice, right? And uh, so, so we figured that piece out, you know, uh, luckily the market uh, gap was there, so we were able to do it. And finally, you know, the competition from Ola and Uber came, because they realized that this market was growing pretty fast. We were, we were doing like 30% month on month growth, without much burn and uh, pretty pretty decent numbers, right? We were getting free downloads all the, all the day. I mean, to this day, we get about 4,000 customers organically. We don't spend a single rupee on marketing. And, uh, you know, they started burning against us directly. So it did hit a little bit in the beginning, but again, you know, we, we survived by by changing our pitches, by changing our, uh, you know, demography a little bit. We went further down into we went to even smaller cities, we went to, you know, we just, whenever there was an issue with the competition, we just found a niche where there was no competition. And uh, luckily, to, to be able to find uh, niches where there is no competition. And so, so you know, in internally we call it cockroach theory, right? You just uh, be the cockroach and keep running around, nobody can catch you, hopefully. <laughs> it's working so far, so let's see. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's great, and somehow this is something that we learn in our entrepreneurship class here as well. I mean, it doesn't matter how big or small you are; it's about being agile and being resilient to actually survive yeah. and find that niche. And something that we really learn is customer validation as well. That are you actually mm -hmm. building a product that people want, and uh, how are you yeah. validating your idea? Because a lot of we see with a lot of technology <coughs> founders that they have a technology, but they're not solving a problem. So. You, yeah. said, you said that you know you went ahead and uh, convinced the drivers to join you, which is an element of trust. But I wanted mm -hmm. to uh, ask more about the economics in terms of the customer angle. So you're competing with Uber, mm -hmm. you're competing with Ola, and uh, I think mm -hmm. you have fifteen thousand drivers on your platform today, or is that more? Yeah, 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 fifteen thousand roughly. Right. Is so that monthly live? Yeah. So then what? Because they come and go, right? Right, right, right. So in terms of. Uh, benefits to the drivers as well as benefits to the customers. How did you go about convincing them to choose your platform over Uber or even for customers to choose your platform over Uber and what were the regulatory hurdles, what were any anecdotes that along the way that you... Mm -hmm. So see, see, I, so yeah, so, you know, to be honest, we followed a very counterintuitive approach, right? At that time, Uber and Ola would say, guys, we'll give you everything, we'll give you a lot of perks and stuff, but you have to delete the other guy's app, right? And we took the opposite approach of that. We said, okay, let's do this. You know, we'd actually teach, we would take drivers and teach them all the free apps. We would teach them Ola, we would teach them Uber, and we'd teach them, uh, you know, uh, Jukun. So we <coughs> tell them that, like, guys, you know, why don't you make more money? You have a smartphone already, and just try to make more money from all the apps. Whoever gives you business, take it. And, and, you know, honestly, drivers really thought that this was stupid, you know, why is he telling us about the competition? We knew that, you know, anyway, they're going to find out about Ola and Uber, right? So might as well we take that holistic approach and we try to create that image that, you know, we are a company that really worries about their, their income. And, and to this day, you know, one of the most important metrics that we have is the driver average income increase, right? So delta, we call it delta income. So you know, how much income was for joining our platform and how much is he making after joining our platform? And we don't even care if the driver is making decent money from Ola and Uber, right? As long as he's active on our platform and as long as he's actually taking rides 
we are okay because in india you know if you if you look at uh, us and indians very uh, kind of different metric like sort of uh, polar opposite that in india there are about uh, 5 million auto rickshaws right 5 million drivers that that is just a massive number right uh, sorry five not five 50 million drivers right so every day uh, sorry sorry guys i got confused so 5 million drive, uh, drivers and 30 million rides happen every day right so that's about six rides per driver if you look at america or any western market right this number is approximately 14 rides per you know it varies from 12 goes up to 16 rides per day per driver right so in India, essentially it means that about 70 or 60 percent of the time in a in a 12 hour shift, a driver is actually sitting at idle, right? Because there are just too many drivers, because you know India has too much population and too many people became drivers because of lack of work. So so no matter how much you know uh, rides Ola gets or Uber gets, so Uber is at about, uh, I think at this moment, uh, roughly a million rides and Ola is at about a million rides, we are at about 50,000 rides. But every day, just auto rickshaws do 30 million rides in India. So, so 3%, 3%, you know, 0.2%, right? That's the market share today. So from that perspective, our logic was that we tell people, guys, just increase your income. Because India, inherently is not a driver limited market there are just way too many drivers in the market sitting idle on the roads right so so this was the first uh, learning and that's the reason why we are surviving right the moment so historically we have seen any city that uber and ola go to the moment they educate the drivers we actually grow there after a certain time so the first three months we decline but after that we stabilize and after six months we start to grow there because the drivers become educated and they say, okay guys, we we'll take all the platforms, we don't care, right? And as the consumers are more and getting into ride hailing, the percentage of this is actually growing for everybody. So the market size is say 30 million, they are at 1.1 and they are at 0.05, but it's everybody. We grow lesser than them, but we still grow. So the ratio is maintained. So, so that's how we tackled competition. So essentially by doing nothing, right? Just, just following our pitch and, and seeing how it goes. Of course, there are much more finer points to it. But the idea uh, certainly is, if the macro numbers are in your side, in your favor, then you don't need to worry about micro numbers, right? That, that's what has worked for us. And finally, regulations. Uh, I mean, you know, in India, don't ask for permissions, ask for forgiveness. And to be honest, you know, just don't care about regulating that. <laughs> Anybody calls you. I, see, I'll give you an example. Every city has a fair or a meter regulation. But nobody really uses it, right? So, like in India, laws are so stringent, maybe even more stringent than US. But their, their you know, use is like really limited. So, so what we did was, and, and to this day we did do this. We go to every city, we talk to the talk to the you know the traffic chair you know commissioner or somebody who's like a senior guy but we go and tell them that see sir we are going to clean up your mess but at the same time if you tell us that you know you follow the regulation we won't come into your city what do you want right and 99 percent answer is please come and clean up your this mess because we are happy that you know somebody is trying to do this so and if and in some rare cases it has happened that they said okay you have to get this permit and that permit they say okay fine we don't want to come in city in the city typically what happens is we go out and they call us back after a few months and that has happened in a lot of cases so most of the places you know there are these far flung areas in new uh, you know northeast india south india where people are not very educated and like really uh, backward india as in compared to india they are backward areas of india the deputy commissioners call us and uh, you know felicitate us, launch the platform themselves because they really see the the you know advantage this platform can bring in. So yeah, from that perspective, in the beginning we ignored it. Now everybody is kind of on board. That's great. I think the first thing you said about just validating the market size. I mean, here at Carnegie Mellon and Tepper, we always thought about analytics, analytics, analytics. Run the numbers first before you make any leap. So it's fascinating that you've done that in-depth study. I mean, I wasn't aware that there were 30 million rights 
a day in India, and uh, yeah, that, that that's a big market share. But something you said. So by the way, yeah. That's my co-founder is a very, very data-driven guy. I'm, I'm a bit more macro guy, so my co-founder is a super micro guy, right? So we are very complementary in that sense, you know. So he's a, he's like always looking at micro numbers. I look at the map big picture. But yeah, we work in that term. I mean, I mean that's good, right? I mean, it's entrepreneurship today is about teams. It's not about the individual. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a very good segue into you know wanted to learn more about Juno as a company and ClickLabs as a company. Mm -hmm. I've seen multiple mm -hmm. of your interviews where you mentioned that um, culture is very important. I know in your offices mm -hmm. you're not allowed to mention Uber and Ola. Is that right? There's, there's supposed to be no words. Not really. So so I had to really see see in the beginning I was super super uh, you know. Uh, I, I was like pretty aggressive about this, but then I had to accept it, you know, because people were always using Ola and Uber secretly. So I, at some point, you know, I just said in a tough call, okay, guys, now you can just do it openly. I don't care. Uh, as long as, and you know, I just had to let go because, I mean, you have to accept, you know, their supply is much bigger than ours, and uh, and also they have taxis. And the problem is, we pay our employees too much. They don't want to take auto rickshaws, man. They just want to take taxis. So, <laughs> can't really do much about it. That's great. But in general, uh, you know, talking about the culture in the company. So, <coughs> see, I think one mistake, uh, or let's say the biggest mistake I have committed as a as a founder, you know, who started out was really I didn't really understand the value of the culture. I mean, I did read all the Silicon Valley, you know, uh, material on you know culture is everything. But didn't really understand what it meant, right? Uh, until, you know, I saw that our attention was bad in terms of people and, and stuff like that. So we also thought, I mean, I inherently, coming from Indian culture, we thought of people as, you know, dispensable people, right? And I'm not proud of that, but that's how, you know, as a businessman, you are, you are kind of brought up to think, right? It's, it's just labor. But uh, but um, somewhere around the time, I would say, you know, maybe in the first two or three years, I realized that this is not the case, right? I mean, this is like businesses are, but you know, people. There is nothing else in this business. This is not a factory we are running. So this is all about people. We started to do a few things, right? Uh, which is which is essentially one of them is that. Uh, Again, we became very, very stringent about hiring people, hiring the top people, right? Uh, this is, I think, what every startup does uh, in the very beginning. And second, which I saw that was uh, that not a lot of people in India were doing at the time. We really invested a lot in training, right? And to this day, we see that you know we hire a lot of freshers, and we train them for six months before they start getting the uh, getting on the real uh, coding, right? So this is on tech side. So we realized that you know if you if you train people for six months, you can really not only get people to your quality, but at the same time you can actually give chances to much more people because education does not really always you know make the person <laughs> completely employable at least in India, right? So so I think uh, this is one thing that you know so training is one thing where we invested a lot in the beginning. To this day we invest a lot. And it has paid us really well, right? It has paid us back a lot because uh, we have never had a lot of uh, issues in terms of uh, you know people not liking us. So we are in a region where there are a lot of colleges, and talent has not really been a problem because of the educational institutes uh, being there. And we actually tie up with all of them. I go talk to people all the time in all those colleges. Because I really want them to come to us and work for a few years and then start their companies. And you know, and now it has happened that we have seen like four or five companies founded by our ex-employees, right? This has happened. We have investors in almost all of them. And uh, so you know we are we are seeing that slowly this ecosystem develops, right? I mean it takes maybe five to ten years, but we are just right now, you know, seeing the starting of it. But our dream is coming true that you know we are not really just a company which is giving employment, but we are hopefully going to start an ecosystem of entrepreneurship, and that's that's really happening. So I think, uh, and and the uh, final thing is which I uh, briefly mentioned is that uh, we encourage entrepreneurship, right? It could be intrapreneurship where we say 
you know, anybody has an idea, you can run with it within the company. You know, so sometimes we know that food delivery won't really work, but you still say, okay, guys, why don't you try it out? And uh, sometimes people have actually proven us wrong and and done things which were which have been uh, kind of improbable, right? So, so I think, uh, and then finally, you know, when people are uh, you know are thinking of starting a company, we always encourage them. And what I to do lose good people. But at the same time, you actually get much more number of people right. who actually eventually want to start companies, right? And these are the kind of best employees anyway, because they are learning it for the long haul. They are not just in it for the pay. So I think uh, focusing on entrepreneurship has really helped. So these are the factors that yeah. really, I think, uh, has helped them. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I mean, that's a fantastic point because now uh, listening to one of my mentors talk and he really mentioned that the shared success model is the best model, right? If you're going to make other yep. people successful along with you, what you're doing with auto drivers, what you're doing with your employees, I mean, that's it's a shared yep. success model. It's not about only the company making money. Um, yeah. So on, on, you mentioned food delivery and for, uh, you know, I sent a description, but Jugnu has also started pioneering food delivery across uh, Chandigarh, if I'm not wrong. And they've also mm -hmm. piloted drone deliveries in Chandigarh as well. I saw the video that you were on Facebook. Yes. Um, so yes. can you talk about the uh, new success and tech innovations at Jugnu? I mean, that Carnegie Mellon, mm -hmm. everyone's focused on machine learning. That's a big thing. Yeah. AI is a big thing. Um, innovation is a big thing. So can you talk about what, mm -hmm. what your biggest wins are in terms of the technology component and the new food delivery or drone delivery innovations that you've started at Jugnu? Yeah. So, 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 see, guys. I mean, as I mentioned, you know, people are the most important thing, right? So, 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 we were a robotics team. So, all the core team pretty much comes from IT and robotics club. So, we, you know, have been when we see these uh, auto driving, autonomous driving cars, uh, we really envy those guys. In fact, I've been to Carnegie Mellon uh, Vision Labs, and uh, my one of my friends was working uh, in your vision department. He's also doing a big startup in Vision now, and uh, and you know I would always feel that dude, when will we get to do all this stuff? And and uh, happily, you know, we have been able to start all those things now. And uh, I think a little bit about drone delivery. So what we did was, uh, you know, we took a pretty much open source stack and we started to kind of just start uh, drone delivery in a very closed loop environment. So this is not commercial yet, so it's all just a closed loop environment. What I mean to say is that it's not happening in a in a residential area. So you know, a drone can fall into into any you know if it falls, it's okay. Like there's no risk to anybody. So so that's the only option we have at this moment. I mean, we're not really so sure of our hardware in the sense that we don't want to do it in a city environment, and also regulations don't permit that. And this is not really something we can swing. So so I think. Uh, because uh, human life is uh, at stake here. So what we're doing is in Singapore, we have this uh, uh, shipyard. So there is a, the ships dock in a little uh, far away uh, in, the, in the water. And then there is a, there is a shipyard, like a, I think a parking lot or something where the stuff has to come. So they needed, so these guys were doing a lot of boat trips for uh, transfer of documents and stuff. So we found those guys uh, and they are using the Airbus drone and our software. So essentially we are, when we say drones, we are really a drone uh, mapping company, right? We just focus on the software on top of drones. So what we do is we will actually guide the drone where to go and stuff like that. And uh, we are really hardware agnostic. So those guys use uh, use drones uh, using our software to, to deliver paperwork and uh, money and small packets to and fro over the bay. So you know, it can fall and there's no security risk and stuff like that. So that's what we're doing. And uh, we're hoping that eventually this will, uh, so, so this is like a B2B uh, kind of uh, implementation, right, of the technology. And we hope that slowly, you know, maybe in a few years when the regulations are a bit sorted and also like the you know, security risks are a bit sorted, we can start this uh, same thing in delivery. So. I mean, of course, you know, it's it's not really very difficult to see how it can change the change the game in the last mile. I mean, if, if it started, 
And, and secondly, what they're trying to do is, which is again sort of a moonshot for us at least, is that we are trying to see can we do intercity uh, autonomous vehicles for cargo, right? So we don't really think that in India, you know, passengers are really uh, really doable at this moment because uh, I mean, if you have been to India, I think uh, traffic is not really very conducive, and uh, there are cows and dogs and all sort of stuff on the road, and. Uh, and, but intercity, I think it's, it's still doable, right? I mean, they're not very different. The roads are not very different from what you have in US or anywhere else. And so what we're doing is the online electric rickshaws, which we are, uh, again, you know, technology stack is pretty much like all open source. We start from there and you know, then start to customize it. A lot of stuff has been done by you guys for, for, for that. And uh, so Carnegie Mellon is definitely the leader in, uh, in vision that way. And uh, so we use that and, and we are hoping, I mean, still we have not gotten any permission to, to pilot it out because uh, it has to run on the standard roads. But uh, we have some uh, air strips, like, you know, abandoned air strips where we can uh, can do these pilots. So so hopefully in a year's time we'll have, like, pilots going, uh, going for just cargo stuff. And, uh, and we think, you know, a lot of people are very dismissive of uh, drone delivery and uh, you know autonomous vehicles in India. I think again if you find niches, right, where which are like small controlled environments, not a super open uh, like you know, don't go for uh, Tesla's autonomous driving kind of thing. But if you find like a very controlled environment, I think you can really you know figure out a decent sized business model. I mean if you go to you know northeast India, you go to hilly uh, areas in India. You can figure out road delivery where it can make sense, right? I mean, I know of places which are by line of sight connected just about uh, less than a kilometer, but you know, driving there takes about half an hour. Um, so you know, this is what we're trying to do, and uh, yeah, let's yep. let's see how it goes. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm glad you mentioned Carnegie Mellon. So, in terms of uh, partnership, uh, do you? I know you're coming mm -hmm. to Silicon Valley in March, April. Um, and you have formed, uh, for those who don't know, Samal also formed Click Labs, which is an incubator and they're doing work with the United States. Um, what partnerships do you foresee between, say, Jugnu and Carnegie Mellon, maybe when you're on one's internships, or, <laughs> yeah. or uh, any kind of like, you know, technology sharing, and can you shed more light on what you're doing with the, the US in terms of uh, your incubators? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, by the way, we have a we have a few people already in Seattle. So, you know, the Click Labs uh, side of uh, business uh, sells uh, like the US is the largest market for us. Uh, so, we are essentially uh, a B two B platform for on demand businesses today, right? I mean, we morph into into like a SaaS uh, based platform. And uh, so, what we're doing uh, with US is, of course, it's our biggest market uh, from a B two B perspective. We have a office. We're actually opening one in Toronto, which is more nearer to you geographically. Yeah. And uh, and what we're doing finally is, see, there is this uh, thesis I have in it out. But this this year, uh, you know, starting uh, in about six months time, we'll, we'll kind of have the first batch. So this is the idea, right? Uh, that we feel that India has very good tech talent, and the, the cost of the talent is really really cheap, right? I mean. You know, and they're like really good people, right? It's uh, they they understand their thing, but at the same time, if you see the kind of business thinking that is needed, I think that is a bit lacking. Because even when I started, I think the exposure that I had in the U.S. really helped me with that, right? Indians are not that good at thinking about uh, you know the, the tech tag business wise, right? I mean that's that's my thesis anyway. No offense to any Indian, I'm also an Indian. So so what we are thinking and hoping is we are actually marketing it in Silicon Valley and marketing it in across the US and Europe. That you know, can we find these founders from these places who are more CEO roles and we find you a CTO from India and you guys start a business in India. We incubate you for a year, we try to find you a find you a uh, investor also, and uh, you know, and I think it's a good, good place to really take off a business off the hand, you know, off the kind of ground, because you know, I'm guessing that if you are just living in Silicon Valley 
for a year, you can have five people team in India, and if you are a bit low maintenance, you know it doesn't matter. So, so we find this, uh, you know, we hope to find some people, and I'll I'll be happy to in fact come to Carnegie Mellon and then, you know kind of talk more about it also. So I'm fairly you know in that way a swing it kind of person. In fact, when I started my company, the first thing I did was I went to Stanford and lived in the campus. And every meetup, I just go there, and uh, if somebody would ask me what I do, I just tell them, guys, I'm doing this, 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 and that got me a lot of, uh, you know, eventually business ideas and stuff like that. And uh, so the idea is that you know, if we can connect the two cultures, like you know, America is really good at business part of things, right? I mean, of course, technology also, but it's just too expensive for a normal person to start companies, to think about starting companies, right? And uh, people have this uh, notion that India is very crazy and stuff. I mean, even though if it's true to a certain extent, but we are trying to give that, give a sort of a, you know, environment where people might be comfortable to come and, and start companies. So then, and yeah, I mean, I, I can give you more update on that in about a year's time when we have something going. Uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, I'm happy to to share more details with you guys, uh, and Ashay can share uh, share across with you guys. If somebody would come to care and start companies, I think that will be. I mean, the talent here is amazing, guys. It, that that's what I can tell you because uh, and and it's uh, you know if you see all these CEOs of uh, Indian origin becoming uh, CEOs, it's because you know the kind of ethos we are kind of uh, brought up with. Uh, of work ethic and stuff, I think it's it's uh, you know it helps us in the in the long run. Now I'm not really a uh, you know economist from that perspective, but I can share details and, and tell you what we can provide. And if, if some something works out, it will be amazing. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Uh, Someone before we turn it to the audience, uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you mm -hmm. a more philosophical question. So I mean, mm -hmm. you've obviously been a risk taker in life, uh, and, mm -hmm. and I think that is. I wanted to ask you about entrepreneurship. A, can anyone be an entrepreneur? One. B, in a business school setting, you know, most most of us are risk averse. You know, you're on that trajectory of getting a job and having a stable career. Not many people take that leap. So, what advice or even anecdotes do you have to share about what, like, what, what do you think makes a successful entrepreneur? Can anyone be one? And uh, sure. in terms of risk, do you have any advice? Sure. So I think, uh, see, first of all, uh, I mean, I would like to say two things to this, right? So one is that, sorry, uh, if you really want to be an entrepreneur, I think the only one question that you need to ask yourself is, are you a fairly low maintenance person, right? I think, you know, especially people who are who have done MBA and stuff like that, right? They have this opportunity cost calculator going on in the background, right? <laughs> there is always this. I mean, I mean, it's just, uh, just telling you from my experience. And so, I mean, a lot of people will say, okay, you know, I should be making, say, you know, 150K a year. If I am giving my startup three years of my life, that's like 450K. I think that is really the reason why a lot of people end up not doing, uh, you know, entrepreneurship. And in, in my case, I think, you know, fairly low maintenance person. And I think I'm a very, very risk averse person, right? I've always taken the obvious decision and the, done a very obvious thing, but I think of the five to 10 years, right? Even today, if we are thinking about uh, this, uh, uh, you know, in incubator thing, we are thinking that, okay, you know, it'll take five to 10 years, but we'll get there because it's a very obvious idea, but it's not obvious for the first six month period, right? And, and you know, I can share an example so I had a uh, had a friend who was actually working with Jugnu, uh, you know. So he came from my college, my batchmate, then went to IIM Ahmedabad, you know, which was the best MBAs in uh, in India. And then he was thinking. Uh, so his uh, he just got married, and his wife uh, drew two graphs for him. So she was also an investment banker, you know, MBA background, then investment banker. She said, okay, you will be a linearly growing graph if you are. A, investment banker right and then uh, then if you don't I mean in entrepreneurship you'll be like a maybe an exponentially increasing graph but most probably you'll be like a you know like just a kind of you know 
you, you get what the curve that is called, right? I don't really know what that curve is called. So I told him, look, this is right, but the only issue that you have is, so you're just assuming that you, know, you will give up at some point. You'll give up in three years or four years or five years. Right? That is the only difference in my opinion. You know, I don't assume that I'll give up. I just know that you know, if I was unsuccessful at this point, you know, I would still keep going, right? If you guys are confident that you know you can keep going for five years, ten years, right? I don't think you guys need any more smarts and you know, like than what you have. If you're sitting in one of the best colleges in the world and there is just no reason why you can't do anything that you set your sights to. It's just that you know, don't set a timeline because in my life also I'm a really bad person when it comes to like if somebody get, tells me okay you have 10 days to do this, you have to do it by 10th day. You know what, I start thinking no man, I don't want to do this, right? But if I think about okay I'll do it on my pace, I think you know every hard working smart person can really do basic stuff, right? And whatever we are doing, at least in Indian context, right? If you go to countries with like, you know, India, Vietnam, Thailand, every corner there is a problem to be solved, right? I mean, you'll see like people doing things in the world. And all you need to tell is, you know, guys, this is how they do it in America or Europe. And they say, wow, this is good. Will you teach us or will you pay, you know, we want to pay to get this solution and stuff like that. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? I mean, some people say that, you know, we need to really just innovate of uh, something which is not there in the world. I think that's okay, you know? I mean, you can do it later in the life, right? Because we are also starting to innovate only now, after eight or nine years into business, into starting this uh, business journey. You know, this is the first time we are really building new stuff. Earlier, we have just taken stuff and really just, you know, improvised and provided solutions using that. So I think, to be honest, you don't have to be a risk taker, you just have to be a long term thinker. A long term just is 5 to 10 years, guys. If you can think in those those terms, I think it's actually very easy to, to be an entrepreneur. That's, that's what I think. That's great. I mean, you know, don't have a plan and then expand to 32 countries and do 50,000 rides a day. I mean, it sounds fairly simple, right? <laughs> So if, if, you, if you look at it, if you look at it from a perspective of the next step, like you know, just look at the next step, I think it's actually simple. But uh, yeah, I mean, you have to be lucky. I think I got lucky, you know, with that drought in uh, in Argentina and a lot of other times. You know, in my co-founders, in my team, in my in the region where I am, uh, you know, I did get lucky a lot of times. But I think a lot of people will get lucky. You just have to keep going. That's fantastic. So somewhere in, in the crowd today, we have people from Japan, Colombia, Puerto Rico, Ukraine, and India. So we're going to open the floor for questions. They're going to come up and ask you a question and uh, for sure. the remaining time that we have. So as the floor is open, who's, uh, who's the first one in? Nobody knows. Okay. Sit first, then others. Yep. Yeah, no. Hey Samar, uh, this is Sid Rawal, first hey, year right. MBA. Um, I had a question about uh, your decision matrix and your decision criteria when you expand into a new city. And really looking at, um, you know, you mentioned a little bit about permits, you mentioned a little bit about, you know, going into a new city and what do you look for, but I'm really trying to understand what else do you really consider when you um, expand into a new city? Sure, so, so there are primarily three matrix that we look at. So one is the population of the city. Right, I mean, it has to be a certain limit. I mean, for example, we don't like to go to cities which are less than 100,000 people in, uh, in population. And then we don't like to go to cities which are over uh, 2 million in population, then they get very uh, political and too big to kind of uh, get to a size. So this is like the size kind of uh, uh, geography. And then the final, uh, and the, the last parameter that we look at is the, the ratio of auto rickshaws to the population, right? So if you see, go to India, you see that in Delhi, for example, you know there are only about uh, uh, you know ten auto rickshaws per hundred people, right? Uh, and and if you go to go to Mumbai, this ratio is like you know thirty auto rickshaws per uh, not sorry hundred people, thousand people, right? So so this ratio is actually the golden number really where we are looking at. 
So go to a mid-sized city, which has this ratio, hopefully, you know, 30 to uh, over 30 per thousand people. That means the drivers don't have the kind of work they would like to have, and you have your platform is very valuable. So this is really what we do. And finally, there is regulatory and uh, kind of you know uh, regulatory stuff that we need to look at. You know, is political stability okay in that city? You know, there shouldn't be any unions and stuff like that. So they are they are all like more logistic issues. But the real metric that we look at is population and the ratio of auto drivers. wondering if you thought about those issues and if Jubni was doing something that would make them different from the other companies and maybe it would give you mm -hmm. a, a competitive advantage over the other firms. Sure. So see, of course, uh, you know, this is actually one of the reasons. Uh, so since we can't really burn that much on people, we actually, this is these are the two factors which we focus on. So one is that on the consumer side, our pitch is that guys, uh, we already have the drivers who are on the road, right? So these are not people who are just, you know, being built into supply. So you don't really know if that person is, uh, is you know, is in it to just make some quick buck or is he really like, you know, job. So that is, you know, these are already permit holders from the government doing this job for like over 10 years. And, uh, and you know, so that, that saves, uh, solves the safety issue at an extent, right? It's not foolproof, but it's much better than situation where, you know, youngsters are being uh, driven into supply, being created into supply very quickly. And second, on the driver side, right, what we tell drivers is, we actually do not, so Ola and Uber will actually tell them to do a minimum number of rides per day, and typically this is 14 to 15 uh, over a, let's say, seven to eight hour period. We actually go the opposite route. We tell drivers to work during peak hours because, as I mentioned, right, there are more number of drivers in India than they are needed. What I feel is that you know, if all the drivers started working, you know, for six hours, but during those six hours they actually really work well, we tell them, guys, you can have the same lifestyle that you are having today. You can just work half the time that you are. So when we, when we talk to drivers, our pitch is simple. You either work half the time or you make double the money, right? And a lot of drivers actually choose to work half the time from what they, so they are earlier working say 12 hours a day, now they start working six hours a day. And we tell them that this is, these are the peak hours that you should work on and just have, have a good life uh, during the rest of the time. And you'll be surprised, a lot of auto drivers actually don't want to make a lot of money, right? They just want to make enough to kind of get by and they would rather work for six hours a day or four hours a day even and, and have a have a decent life with their family. So yeah, just uh, trying to give them a work life balance. Great. Thank you. Who's next? Tarun and then See, I mean, to be honest, we didn't really do anything of that sort. So all we did was we just uh, branded the drive uh, auto rickshaws. So we just have a small sticker on the on the rickshaw which says Jumnu, and uh, and when the person asks for what this uh, what does Jumnu mean, uh, the driver tells them, okay, you know, you can just call the call the prop, call the auto to your doorstep. And this is the beginning of proposition, right? I mean, in India. You know, in uh, in US, uh, uh, the situation is that you know you go out, there is a taxi stand nearby, or you get a taxi on the road very quickly. In India, it's not really the case, right? Because especially if you're wherever you're living, it's really tough to really get a cab uh, or a, or an auto uh, just by going out. 
right? So, so you, if you have the option to not walk or not wait for 15, 20 minutes, it's a decent uh, value proposition. And finally, you know, in India, people are, their auto drivers are, uh, you know, very notorious for haggling with prices. So, give people a choice to not wait for a driver outside, and uh, secondly, you know, no haggling about prices. I think that's all the value proposition we give them. And we don't really promise a better ride, to be honest. You know, we say, okay, you'll get the same ride, it just comes to you, right? Uh, and at, the, at a predetermined price. So these, these two things are really big enough for them. So first of all, you know, the business incubator kind of thing, I'm not really very involved. It's more like a financial investment from our side, from that perspective, and the team runs it. And secondly, on the on the Jukum side of things, you know, how do we decide what to do? So see, we have a formula uh, internally, and we, we really go through a B2B2C round, right? What it means is that typically whenever we launch something, we don't really go B2C directly. We would actually go to a partner and uh, so, for example, you know, medium-sized grocery chain, and, and we tell them, okay, guys, do you want to partner up who does not have a you know on-demand solution? And we'll say, okay, you know, why don't we partner up and we'll sell you the B2B solution, like the technology tech stack, as a B2B kind of offering. And uh, it's uh, and if it works out well, then we can kind of you know on it, right? So as a, as a testing ground. We typically will find partners, and this is the same thing we do in, in uh, out of uh, India countries, right? So we are in about 32 countries. I mean, in fact, as of yesterday. So, so the model is to find right partners in all these places, be it a different geography, be it a different uh, business stream, and give them the tech stack, right? If it works well, then we can think of getting into it B2C ourselves. But in most of the cases, we have seen, you know, going B2B and finding partners is much better because you get to work with a person who really understands their business well, right? These grocery guys really understand grocery well. Same with laundry, you know, not many businesses. And if you look at Uber and Ola model, they really want to make it very high margin models, right? They want to say, okay, we want to have 20% margins or 30% margins in the long run because they have to satisfy their investors. Right, but we take the opposite approach. We say, okay, we keep it very low margin. They're okay with two or five percent margin, just like a credit card company. But we would like to partner with everybody. So only time will tell, you know, which approach is better. But our approach is to really, you know, focus on being a tech stack and take a two to five percent margin and find partners rather than try to own the whole the whole thing ourselves. So, so that's uh, that's how we do it. Uh, so we have uh, three, four minutes more. Uh, any m more questions? <coughs> Your hair. Your hair is from our, our favorite person from Japan. <laughs> he loves, he loves from yeah. us. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's a wonderful speech. I, I really like that. And my question Thank is, uh, keeping up with technology is really critical. And how would you keep up with the recent technology and recent innovation so that your company stay on track like on a daily source basis or how would you like what kind of information source do you refer to on a daily basis? Yeah, that's a very good question actually. So you know, so we uh, I think rather than I mean of course we read the same news on the industry, but what we try to keep thinking every day is what is going to disrupt us? Right. For example, you know, drone delivery. If it starts, of course, we are going to be disrupted. Right. So I think the idea is that we keep thinking about every technology, keep reading about technology, and what is going to disrupt us. That's where we want to get into. Right. We do not think that 
So, so sometimes what happens is people say, okay, it's going to take 10 years, don't worry about it. So one thing that we don't believe in, because when the disruption comes, it comes really quickly, right? It means it's very, very tough to really uh, fight it out. So we just keep thinking what is going to disrupt us. And if something is going to disrupt us, then we really need to start investing in it today. Uh, you know, even if it takes five to 10 years or maybe even more time. So yeah, just keep thinking what's going to disrupt you. Thank you. Uh, Samar, you have five more minutes or are you time constrained? If you have oh, that's okay. I can, I can, yeah, it's okay. No worries. Okay. Um, Karan and then Priya. Hey, Samar. Thanks for your time. Hey, man. Thanks. So you touched upon how the macros are really great in India. And entry of Ola and Uber into your city is driving the overall awareness about ride hailing systems. Now, as the awareness increased, the competition from other new players would increase as well. So, what are your thoughts mm -hmm. on creating sustainable, sustainable value proposition in the long run? I would say, to be honest, uh, in this ride hailing space, anybody new coming in, you know, maybe not, I mean, I don't see it happening at this moment. Right? I mean, if it happened, it, it's not really, uh, I mean, at that point, we'll think about what's the issue. But really, the population is coming from new type of mobility services, like, you know, scooter hailing, bike sharing, you know, uh, so that kind of things. So, I think uh, India is very, very diverse when it comes to, uh, when it comes to kind of, you know, to see the market size and the demographics of people. So, a lot of solutions will coexist. But as a company, what we feel is, and what can be good, done a little better is, they can all the companies at least try to be a bit more interoperative, right? I mean, for example, at this point, Oda, Uber, Dimnu, you know, Rapido, like a few more players, which are a bit different in uh, offerings, are completely their own ecosystems, right? They don't interoperate at all, right? I think that is not really a good way to operate because if you look at most the mature industries or semi-mature industries, there will still, you know, there will be competition, but they will still collaborate in some ways, right? For example, what's the point of a driver having four different apps in his in his phone, right? You can you can just uh, let the driver choose, right? Now also, you know, he's kind of choosing it anyway, which which app upon at this moment. I think if if people stop thinking about trying to build a monopoly, of course we are small, so you know, it's it's obvious that we'll say this. But I generally feel that the player who wins, like if you see the Monopoly game, right, the player who wins is not generally the player who gets the best cards or the best uh, places, but it's actually the player who trades the most, right? So, so if you really trade and kind of collaborate the most, I think that's a that's a good way to to look at business. That's that's how we see it at least. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Priya. <coughs> Yeah. Uh, I have one question out here that there have been uh, really good technologically advanced apps in India and I was a software developer myself working in Bangalore and they have failed and here you are you say that you made the obvious choices and you are risk averse at the same time. So what were your decision criteria or what were you thinking when you say that you made the obvious choice and now it's working for you? So see there are I think two aspects to it. One. We were never really, you know, uh, I mean, I see a lot of apps in the country which are very ahead of their time, right? They're like, like they're, they're sort of very, doing very good stuff, but most people don't really care about it, right? So, so, this, uh, so which, like I'll give you an example of, let's say something like, uh, uh, you know, so in US, like there is this dog walking app, right? I'll just give you an example. And, and I know a few of people who did this in India and, and failed. My thinking is that, you know, whoever has dogs in India doesn't really care about uh, a walker. I mean, they, they do it themselves or they have servants and stuff. And those who don't have, most people don't have dogs in India, right? So this is just an example that, you know, even though the product is kind of nice in theory, but the, the context doesn't really work that way, right? I mean, in that sense. 
So, so obvious is like you know, is this really a big problem that what Ashay mentioned right in the beginning? So, and the second point is, which is like kind of related to this, is that we are very uh, brutal about judging ourselves with data, right? If people are not requesting our rights, that really means that you know the market is not there, right? So, so even today, most of the places we are driver constrained. And till the time we are driver constrained, we are happy. But if we are not driver constrained, we are supply, uh, we are demand constrained, right? Like people are just not requesting rights, then we are obviously not doing the good business. Either Ola and Uber have already taken all the demand, or you know, people just don't want it. So, so the first fact is that people would have to really want the product. If they don't want the product, don't try to sell it. You know, there are sometimes if it's, it's similar to saying, you know, why doesn't champagne sell a lot in India? People just don't want it. Maybe from a price point perspective, maybe from a you know taste perspective or something. The idea is that you know have a good product market fit. I think trying to get the product market fit by by pushing it is a mistake some people do. I mean, it has to just be there. It's either there or not there. If it's not there, don't try to make it happen. That's what my thinking is. I don't know Steve Jobs will, will disagree with me, but <laughs> I'm not a Steve Jobs fan. I'm just trying to like figure out all this stuff. Um, any more questions for Samar? So uh, Samar, um, again, thanks so much for spending time with us today. I think for me at least the biggest learning I got was whether you're from Puerto Rico, China, Japan, India, there is always a possibility to find opportunity in chaos, right? It's all about you know sticking yeah. out there and being resilient. Do you have any final words yeah. for us before we say goodbye? I know you're in Dubai right now. He's in Dubai. Um, were you on the transportation board? Uh, there was a Facebook Live video yesterday. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I was actually on the transportation last night delivery kind of thing. So I'm trying to actually sell our platform uh, to the Dubai taxi taxi guys. So, nice. so let's see. <laughs> Great. Um, so, yeah, so any, any final words before uh, we say goodbye? Any piece of wisdom? I, you know, like, uh, I, I can just say one thing, guys. I mean, a lot of times, I mean, people really want to think the end game, right, before starting something out. I think just start it out that, you know, I mean, you guys are smart enough to figure it out. You can't really figure out everything before starting out. But I think along the way, you will definitely figure it out. That, People were much less smarter for figuring it out today. So you know, so great. Well, let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> That's right. and, uh, the video on Facebook Live, you can stream it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so thanks again, yeah. and we keep in touch. Let's thanks, meet. Let's thanks. meet in Silicon thanks. Valley when we're real there. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, man. See you soon. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.